Hey. Hey. Uh, Yatahe is uh, in my in my in my language. Um, so this is uh, this is like a lot of us this is our life work, right? And so I think we all have a story of why we've dedicated ourselves uh, to this industry and, and this passion. And so uh, my heritage is uh, I'm Northern Sierra uh, Miwok. My tribe uh, was in Nevada City, Grass Valley area. My people have been here for more than 10,000 years and uh, miners and uh, basically displaced and massacred my tribe. So uh, changed my, my family's life forever. And um, my great, great, great grandfather, um, when gold was discovered and um, he went north and he ended up up where uh, the town of Downeyville is now. And um, by the time the miners arrived, he was really intimate with the canyons and the plants and the animals. And he also knew uh, where the gold was. And so uh, he connected with this family called the Shaughnessy's and he started running pack mules and developing a lot of the routes that Downeyville is famous for today. Um, this is a pictograph of Downeyville in 1854. Um, there was estimated to be 10,000 people living in that town that now there's around 150 full-time residents. Uh, but you can see like they fire safe the community basically just clear cut to build the town and then rerouted the river. It was a pretty, pretty wild time, uh, but it also established like these world famous trails. So uh, I grew up in Nevada City and, uh, and my parents had uh, a 1942 Jeep. This was recreation in the 70s, right? Just jeeping around. Also had a ski boat, like that was the thing. Uh, and so um, we would take a month every summer and um, we would drive around. And um, this picture on the right, my mom has this funny story about um, basically where my dad got the Jeep stuck was where we camped. And so we were in this spot for 10 days before some other people oh, wow. came along and uh, it helped my dad get the Jeep out of the spot. Um, but always an adventure, swam every fork of the Yuba, kind of like had all these really cool swimming holes that I knew about. And uh, my dad also had these old maps. And so we would go and try and find, you know, old mining spots and old cabins and, um, one thing that was just instilled in me was like, leave it cleaner than you found it. We always had like a garbage bag and we would clean up and, uh, and um, yeah, just explored around. And then um, as a teenager, my parents got me a mountain bike, uh, really kind of keep me out of trouble. I was headed down a kind of a bad rough path. And, uh, and so they bought me a mountain bike and I had, you know, a knowledge of Downeyville and uh, these maps and so would just pack a couple sandwiches and some tubes and just head out, you know, and uh, go swim in. It was like the ultimate freedom for me. And so started to get to know like the Downeyville trail system and rode to the top enough to be like, people would pay for this shit to get a lift. So uh, somehow I got a, a credit card for $10,000 uh, in the mail. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> I went and I put a down payment on a van and I bought a rack for the van. And I guided my first uh, trip in Downeyville in 1991. And then didn't have money to take out ads in mountain bike magazines. So what I did is I, uh, I would fly an editor into the Reno airport, which was like a hundred bucks at the time. And I'd pick them up and I would just take them out onto the trails. And, uh, and they couldn't help but like be, say this shit was awesome. <laughs> and so, uh, and like in 1994, mountain bike action called it, you know, world's best downhill. I think that's probably many of the article Joe had saw. Uh, we had bike magazine out, uh, a picture on the right was the very first Tasman in, in Downeyville up on chimney rock, which is kind of fun. Um, <coughs> so I had, I had permits to be able to operate this guide business. I had, uh, I started the Downeyville classic, uh, which was called the coyote classic at the time in 1995. So operating under permits, things were uh, seemingly going pretty well. I was living in Downeyville. And then in 2001, we had like this really huge winter. And, uh, and basically this is what the trails all looked like. There were hundreds of trees down. 
And, uh, and so being under permit, I called the uh, forest service and I was like, Hey, you guys got to get out there cause this place is a mess. And, uh, and the guy at the time, uh, Bill Harry was our forest service person was like, Hey, we're, we have no budget. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to jump in and, and start helping out. And so there were three of us, uh, pretty core mountain bikers living in Downeyville at the time. And, uh, one of them was, uh, Mike Ferentino here. So we went and we bought a chainsaw, like a $700 chainsaw. And the very first tree we got us stuck. And so, uh, the next day we went down to, to Grass Valley, we bought another chainsaw to get that chainsaw out. Uh, so this was like when we got through the first tree, those two chainsaws, uh, really kind of kicked off like our inventory and, uh, and this storm really kicked off, um, when we really like stepped in and started, uh, not really taking matters into our own hands, but really partnering with the national forest. Um, and it marked the time when I took my for-profit uh, businesses and started to pour all the profits into this nonprofit so that we could start. Really, we just wanted to take care of the trails at the time. So uh, we're now in the business of revitalizing mountain communities and we use trails as a tool to be able to do that. So in 2003, uh, we formed the CR Beeps Trail Stewardship and it was really to start writing grants so that we could buy tools because we started doing these volunteer work days and uh and we, we were really successful so we had so many people coming up we didn't have enough tools and so people just stood around and drank beer and so we're like we got to get some tools in these people's hands so we started writing grants um so it's we're in a pretty unique area um and when i say like we use trails as the tool it's really uh, we're in severely disadvantaged uh, economies and communities, uh, really because we're surrounded by national forests and the jobs for generations have come from resource extraction, from logging and from mining. Um, so for generations, we've had people leaving to support their families. And so part of this is really economic growth, job creation. Um, we're also at the headwaters of the largest watershed of the Sierra Nevada. And so uh, there's this term that we use uh, forest to faucet. So 65% of California's clean drinking water comes out of our region. And uh, that's why we feel like people uh, like, you know, in the, in the Bay areas in Southern California, uh, when they vote, they should be thinking about us because we're, we're the stewards of their, of their water. So I also want to acknowledge uh, we're in the homelands of the Miwok, the Nisanan, the Maidu, the Washoe, and the Paiute tribes. So we use trails really to showcase the history of uh of what happened there and the indigenous folks um and shared stewardship and ultimately we want to have good times with good people so uh, we call our region the lost sierra and it's partly um you know people know like where lake tahoe is Truckee, and then there's just like this abyss up there you know and so um and we also keyed in there was a mail route during the gold rush and it was called the lost sierra route um, and I think the mailman got lost a lot in the winter. And so we kind of like coined that, that term of being in the lost Sierra. And again, um, part of it's too, is like a loss of jobs, a loss of industry. And, uh, in some cases, a loss of pride because there isn't any jobs. So, um, we were two of the richest counties, Plumas and Sierra twice, once during the gold rush, again, during the timber boom. Uh, and then from 2000 to 2020, we've seen unemployment hit like over 16%. And we've watched our population decrease. Um, again, it's a big reason is because we're surrounded by national forests. We're over 70% national forests in our region and the national average is 8%. So we're really dependent on those partnerships. Um, and, uh, and also like if you, own, if you own property up there, you're paying property tax. If you're the federal government, you don't pay property tax. So our counties, like our public services, are typically really poor. So 2003, we got our nonprofit status. Um, we've, this, this was our numbers at the start of this year. Uh, we built around 35 miles of trail just this year. So we're up around 150 miles of brand new trail construction on federal land. Uh, over 100,000 hours of volunteer <laughs> labor. And, uh, and last year we had 72 employees, 39 of those were youth. So high school students we hire from, uh, from our region, put them to work. Uh, they're making like 15 bucks an hour. 
They're also like spy camping, cooking, cleaning for each other, uh, learning a lot of a lot of skills, a lot of life skills. For some of them, we're like walking them down to the bank and opening them up a checking account so they can deposit their uh, their paychecks. So um, yeah, we all hopefully survived the pandemic, but uh, we're we're a much different organization than uh, than when we went into it. So um, going into the pandemic. Uh, Donations were 3% of our $2 million organization and bike races made up 35%. So uh, bring in the pandemic and we lost all of our events. Uh, we also, we have a guide outfitter service still, UB Expeditions that, uh, you know, was started in 1991. Um, that was affected. Um, our grants still uh, held pretty strong, but, um, and even my role as an executive director changed a lot. Uh, I went through a lot of coaching and mentorship to really be able to be comfortable, like asking donors for funding um, and different ways of, of just being able to look at our organization and how we were going to keep each other living up there. And so uh, last year we turned donations up to 38%. Uh, we still are hovering around a $2 million organization um, and we still didn't have bike races. So uh, once we bring back uh, these events, we're gonna have kind of four legs to the stool. And we feel like we're gonna be pretty healthy again. Um, things, are, things are going good, you know, with the, with the guide outfitter business and then uh, grants. For us, like we don't ever wanna get too heavy in the grants because what happens is you kind of live and die by them. And it's a very volatile cycle of like, if you get a big grant and you're scaling up and then the next year you don't get it, um, so really having those donations and for us, like kind of making our own money through the guide outfitter business and through events, it's uh, much more comforting and we can use those funds to leverage uh, grant funds because uh, no grant is free. Sometimes it's a one to one match. Uh, other times it's, you know, 25%. So um, just allows us to be like more competitive and go after uh, grant funding in different ways. So. We, uh, we've been, you know, we've been at this for a while and I got, um, basically I got invited to present at a, it's called Mountain Ventures Summit and it was in Mammoth. And, uh, and I just, my, one of my board members, we had a bunch of sticky notes and we're like mapping stuff. And, and we just kind of came up with this idea of like, what if we tried to connect these communities that, um, a lot of, a lot of the communities up there are struggling and, uh, and so we just like threw out this little presentation and I went to Mountain Ventures and I, and I pitched it and it was like to connect 15 mountain towns throughout the Northern Sierra. Uh, at the time we thought it was gonna be uh, like 300 miles of trail and it was all based around economic resilience and recovery. And, uh, and there was a guy who uh, was the executive director of Sierra Nevada Conservancy, which is a state organization in the crowd. And afterwards he stood up and he's like, I'm in. We're going to figure this out for so for a year and a half we really dove into like what was it going to mean to be able to do this project um and so it's called connected communities and um you know we really wanted people to be really open-minded about it so we came up with this cartoon map of what it might look like and this was pretty key to our success in terms of uh leaving it to people's imagination and also not like really narrowing down. So people were like, oh, so you're gonna go on that ridge or what about this watershed? Or, you know, really just left it pretty open. And we pushed really hard on the fact that this was about economic recovery and sustainable growth uh, and the new jobs that were gonna be uh, created through this effort. So um, we have in our region, we have the Pacific Crest Trail that comes through, uh, it's the National Scenic Trail. 2,600 miles, um, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't bring people into the main streets of the town. So we really wanna drive an economy into these towns. So ideally people are bringing their credit cards or staying in the motels or eating at the restaurants. Um, and so, and we also had this idea, this acronym of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access through recreation. So we want this to be a trail for everyone. And what I mean by that is uh, if you can fit on a, on a single track trail, you're gonna be welcome to be on this trail. So uh, it's gonna be open to motorcycles, e-bikes, mountain bikes, hiking and equestrian. So uh, pretty bold, but at the same time, uh, people support it because it is, is inclusive of all the user groups. 
And this is a slide that I use um, mainly for our, our county supervisors and um, to show them like, hey, this can work. And it's because recreation is the third largest economy in the United States. It's around $900 billion a year. And then we're gonna hit all these aspects of it from fishing to wheel sports to trail sports. Uh, so we're confident like, you know, we're surrounded by national forests. We can't put in like a shopping mall. We can't do developments. We can't have uh, football stadiums, you know? So trails are, are our chance really to bring this economy back. And it's a, you know, as we all know, it's a green industry. So, so once we were funded through this, um, through uh, Sierra Nevada Conservancy, it was really uh, my job to really get support for this project. And so um, this is still something that I do. I, I, you know, I meet with senators and Congress people. Um, so this, this project has unprecedented support and it has bipartisan support. So uh, anywhere from like, uh, you know, Republican Congress people to uh, senators who are Democrats. Uh, we have uh, Plumas, Sierra, Lassen, Butte, and Nevada counties. So five, five counties that are signed on to this. This is a six county project. Uh, and it also goes into the state of Nevada. That's like the last piece that we have put together. Um, we also went to like all the land trusts, uh, got their support. Um, so really this was about like answering questions, getting them to sign a letter of support, which um, is something really easy for organizations to do. We didn't ask them for money. We didn't ask them for help. We asked them for a letter of support and what it caused was them to really learn about the project because their boards had to vote yes or no. Did you shave for the paintings? Did I? No, this is part of my deal, man. I don't know if any of this would happen without the beard. <laughs> um, a big reason like this happens is because um, a lot of the people I work with, we've been working together for 30 years. You know, it's a lot of respect, uh, relationships, and um, and like honestly, like doing what you say you're gonna do, and uh, and always being there to to support your partners, you know, and our partners, like Matt was saying, like advocating is not necessarily a good word, you know, like we don't advocate, we support our partners. So like if the Forest Service decides, hey, you know, that trail isn't gonna be open to motorize, like we don't go against them and say, hey, you know, that shouldn't be happening. It's like, that's your decision. You're the land manager. We're just making recommendations. Um, so what I'm gonna go through here is just kind of like how we engage the public and the steps that we took. Um, and most of them worked, some of them didn't work. Um, but again, you know, and, and there was talk about like this toolbox, uh, this, this project will produce kind of a recipe book um, that will be used for sure, like in our region, but I, th I think it can be used internationally, the steps that we've taken. Um, and it doesn't fit necessarily everywhere. This really, because it is economic development, it's job creation, you couldn't take this project to like the streets of San Francisco and, and pilled trails. They'd be like, we already have a lot of people. We already have jobs. So this is kind of unique to rural, rural areas, uh, especially if you have a lot of public lands. So this is basically how we started. And we started um, like right when the pandemic kicked off. So we, we had like steps that we were gonna take. And then we kind of had to reshuffle those around uh, cause we weren't, we definitely weren't doing town hall meetings. Um, so uh, this is how it started. We put together um, a dedicated web page um, with kind of the grant information and um, and really just information, not opinions. But like this is this is the meat and potatoes in the grant. These are the steps that we said we were going to take. And then um, for the first time, uh, Sierra Nevada Conservancy <laughs> funded social media posts. So we were doing targeted ads through Facebook and Instagram for specific regions. Um, and they were and they were allowing us to do that. So the first kind of paid ads that came through this process, um, we reached like 166,000 people through Facebook. Again, these numbers have gone up, uh, and around 208,000 through uh, Instagram through paid ads. And then uh, we produced an infomercial. Um, it's called a Trail for Everyone. It's available um, on our site, but it really. Uh, talked about the community, the need for uh, jobs, um, pinpointed like a couple of the people that live there, their stories. Um, but this is a tool that, uh, this is this film was made almost two years ago. This is still a tool that I use uh, anytime I send an email to like state, federal legislators or new partners this is a tool that we use constantly. And so it's uh, it's been viewed almost 2 million times. 
Um, and then and then we started getting on the on the phone, you know, and calling people, asking for these letters of support, um, whether they are land managers or organizations, residents. Um, and then, because all the businesses were closed, we went to the essential businesses, so grocery stores, gas stations, banks, hardware stores, and we had these informational kiosks. We had sixteen of these uh, developed. And in there were these paper booklets that were, um, there were eight regions, we broke it into different regions. And in these paper booklets was a survey. And then there were uh, topographic maps that were real easy for people to draw on. So we encouraged people like, hey, show us where you wanna go, show us where you don't wanna go. Um, and then they were able to just drop the, the brochure, the um, survey into this box. We would come grab them out of there. And we thought like, well, maybe some people will fill them out, but we had like really good, really solid response. Um, and when I wrote this grant, we were gonna do 16 town hall meetings. I ended up doing over 90 individual meetings, uh, socially distanced in the parks, my first Zoom meetings. I hate for Zoom, but it was super effective. Um, and basically just, again, just all this community outreach. We also had that survey available online. Those maps were uh, downloadable online. Um, and then uh, here's the results from the survey. So we got uh, almost 1,200 people to take the survey. 68% of them were locals, 32% uh, visitors, a wide range of age groups, um, 18 to 65 plus. So, um, and this, this is information that like we use again, like, cause this was, uh, this was like the people's plan. This is what the people wanted. This wasn't the forest service asking. This was a nonprofit. So we got really great results. 98% of people, you know, felt trails were important. 96% uh, uh, wanted their, tra their town connected by a trail. Uh, one of our favorites was 88% of those people said they'd volunteer and help build the trail. Um, and we had over 800 people that actually took the time to draw on those maps. So it took us a while to really like digest that information. Cause again, we thought people would just kind of like, ah, oh, whatever, I'll just do the survey. But people really were drawn in there and uh, showing us like some really cool old stuff. And then uh, other people were like, don't go here. <laughs> you know? um, we also went to um, almost every business in the, in the counties, 237 businesses. We went just right to the owners or the managers uh, had them take this survey and 87% thought that this um, project would, would better their business. And where we kind of fell off was like, you know, like some of the main streets in the town now are like Amerigas, like a propane company, you know, or they're not, they're not like a service industry, typical main street kind of uh, environment. So um, the biggest question we got was like, when do we start? Can we do this now? So uh, it was pretty exciting. We also, uh, part of the planning is um, we printed these uh, topographic maps. They were three feet by four feet. For the whole region, they were 16 feet by 12 feet and they, we made them a dry erase marker. So I'd go to these meetings with dry erase markers, uh, let people like draw on them and then I would take a photo of it and, um, and then erase it and like let the next person come in and you start to see like these patterns come in over and over again and then each of those photos are a uh, GIS person would just geo-reference them. So we'd start to just do these overlays uh, and just kind of see where the common areas were, the common grounds. So once we, once we took in that information, then we went back to the communities, back to these um, working groups that we had developed, back to the land managers. Um, we also engaged with all the tribes. So uh, along the process, you know, wanted to make sure that the tribes were uh, aware of the project. Some of them chose to participate. Some of them, uh, you know, didn't participate, but also didn't object. Not that that means that they support it, but they were certainly uh, in the know. Um, and then we also several times met with uh, the Forest Service uh, specialists, since this is all on national forest land. So heritage, wildlife, botany, hydrology, uh, making sure that this trail is going to be in the optimum location, that there were any known uh, areas of concern or red flags areas. It's like super easy just to move the line over now while it's still in the planning phase. 
So uh, we're, we're pretty much through the, the back and forth and we have crews that are out there right now ground truthing. So that's basically taking the, the GIS data um, and going out and like crawling through the bushes, hanging flags, making sure that uh, like we have a really powerful GIS uh, person that um, probably, you know, one of the best. He, we actually have the, our data set is more rich than the Forest Service because we've gotten all this information from land trusts and, and other groups. Uh, so they can now come to us for the information, which is pretty cool. Uh, but we are out ground truthing, hanging flags, and then sharing those findings back with the Forest Service. Um, and then some of these projects are now in the environmental process. So here in California, we have to do NEPA, which is National Environmental Policy Act. And then on top of that, we have to do CEQA, which is the California version. Um, and a lot of that ties to like the funding source. Like you're not gonna get state funding unless you've done the California version of the environmental work, but very costly too. Um, so what we thought was gonna be 300 miles of trail, once we've mapped it out, and gone through all the community um, engagement and seeing like where people want to go. And then, you know, trying to, these are going to be, um, I would call them like traveling trails. Cause some of them you're going to be, you know, point to point, it could be like 75 miles to get from one town to the next. Um, so we're hitting a running grade of like 7%, you know, meeting forest service specification. These aren't going to be no maintenance trails, mm -hmm. but they're going to be low maintenance trails. So we don't want to create uh, a lot more work for ourselves. Um, but we also want to make sure that these are enjoyable for people um, and sustainable. So this is the northernmost region. This goes up into Susanville, Chester. Uh, this is the southernmost region, which uh, Truckee is at the, at the southern gateway of this project. It does touch into Reno. Um, and then you're kind of seeing like these yellow areas. These are um, something that we didn't really think would be part of the project. We didn't really see this, but these were through these meetings with the community and people drawn on those maps, they would circle areas and be like, we need trails here. What about this spot? And so we're calling them recreation zones. And uh, there's 11 of them that got identified throughout this project. So beyond just the linear trail connections. Um, and then, uh, you know, up in Northern California, we're pretty good at catching on fire lately. And so um, this map uh, was made by our GIS person. It shows the last two years uh, actually 2020 and 2021 uh, fire activity. So almost 70% of our county burned over the last two years. And so uh, the white lines are basically seeing uh, the, the proposed La Sierra route and where we're gonna be going through fire areas. So it's definitely something to consider. It's not all of it's not like, you know, completely nuked. So it was actually a really healthy burn, uh, but we're looking at like, how do we use trails now to educate the public uh, on fuels management projects. And so these recreation zones, most of them are in what's called a wildland urban intermix, and that's where private land meets federal land. So we're looking at trails as permanent and sustained control lines uh, for fire. Also being able to do back burning off those trails um, and, and kind of presenting like a desired condition of what those are gonna look like and how how, how recreational trails basically meet fuels management in today's uh, new era of mega fires, um, ingress and egress for firefighters. So uh, these will be some like uh, some of the first projects that happen to start to integrate fuels with recreation. Um, so, and also these rec zones will, uh, they'll have this main street trailhead. You know, we want people to just be able to walk or bike right from their town, not have to get into a car. Um, we're gonna have learning landscape. And what I mean by that is a lot of interpret interpretive signage about the history of the place, you know, the indigenous tribes, the, the gold rush, uh, the logging, uh, really use it to, a lot, for a lot of people, their first time on public lands is through a trail. So how do we like educate them on public, um, you know, if there's a bill to vote for public lands or like for our Sierra Nevada Conservancy to get funded, uh, this is our chance to really educate folks um, and then there's uh, this big initiative called 30 by 30, which is um, a national push to conserve 30% of the lands. Uh, so we feel like these rec zones uh, meet a lot of those same goals. So instead of a national monument or in some cases wilderness, uh, we're really pushing for these rec zones to be identified. Um, and these will be stacked loop systems. So they'll have, uh, you know, ADA accessibility. Uh, we, we're looking at like plugging in some adaptive trails where we can. 
Um, but you know, again, not a, that whole inclusion element for recreation. So we're, we're deep into this. We're going to publish the plan in the spring. We hope, you know, we've had the pandemic and the wildfires have set us back a bit, but, um, currently of those 600 miles, we have 157 miles that's in the environmental process right now, uh, which is, which is exciting and also pretty nerve wracking. We just uh, actually hired our own environmental planner. Um, to work with consultants because they're starting to be like this. We don't know what they're talking about. And uh, so really needed to tighten ourselves up between that GIS manager, the environmental planner. And then uh, we hired a director of ground operations that came from uh, 30 years of firefighting career uh, and has ran like up to 90 individual crews. Um, so that's where we're going to bring kind of this fire element and fuels management to recreation. So. You know, this, this, is, this is what it takes to build 600 miles. You got to have the talent uh, beyond the money. So, um, and right now, uh, shovel ready projects, we have 125 miles of trail that we're actively uh, building, seeking funding for. And then um, this year so far, we've maintained 240 miles. So uh, that includes big sections of the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, we work in wilderness. Uh, like if there's a trail, we're, we're up for working on it. So that's been key to our success of, you know, it would have been really easy for us. Like if, when we were in Downeyville, three mountain bikers to call ourselves like Downeyville mountain bike organization or, you know, but just the, just that little mindfulness of like, okay, well, we're, there's dirt bikers here and there's hikers and calling ourselves a trail stewardship has really uh, been a great gateway for us to, to bring everybody together that and barbecues. You know, having having a good barbecue and, and beers, you know, there's nothing like uh, working on the Pacific Crest Trail and having dirt bikers there helping and mountain bikers and nobody really knows how they recreate. And then they're all helping on the same project and then they're around the barbecue and they realize, oh shit, you're a dirt biker. <laughs> uh, I guess we can get along, you know, so. You teach them how to play crud? Oh. Well, yeah, we used to. We're gonna bring crud back, so. <laughs> When the pandemic happened, we kind of put the brakes on crud. So, um, so, so this is a forty million dollar project just to build those linear trails. That doesn't include these rec zones. So, this is like a big part of my job now. It's like turning couch cushions. And so, um, I'm going to talk about just a couple of the mechanisms that we use to fund our to fund ourselves. Um, and then also this timeline to show that it's real. Like we want to complete this by 2030. Uh, mainly because I'm 50 and I want to be able to go out and enjoy this while I can. So the pressure's on a bit. Um, so we've created uh, what's called a vision circle. And these are for um, kind of like high level um, donors to come in. I mean, it's not super high. It's $2,500 a year. They commit to three years um, all the way up to we have some donors that come in, you know, at the $100,000 level, uh, which is super nice. And so the beginning of the year, we had $2.6 million in grants uh, lined up for this project and they averaged with a 26% in-kind match. So my task was to find $676,000. Uh, and so right now I'm like, I need 108. <laughs> so if you're holding, don't hold out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, I think we're, I'm super excited about this. Is there any way we can, uh, I want to bring this back to my whole uh, will this be available to us like to, to yeah. take pictures of the whole thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can send I can send it out. I can get everyone the contact info for all this stuff. Great. Yeah, sure. So we also have a uh, partner collective. So, you know, we've had great industry support, you know, like, like for instance, Santa Cruz bicycles, right? The year that we started the stewardship, we didn't do the big mountain bike festival. Um, and we knew it was going to take some energy and some funding. So uh, Santa Cruz was our title sponsor of the event and uh, basically met with with the powers to be. And um, they decided we're going to give you the same amount of money we would if you were going to do the event to help kickstart the Sierra Beach Trail stewardship. So we've always had great support um, from the mountain bike industry, it seems like. And now uh, we're trying to branch out like we need to get, you know, everybody on board if they use a trail we need support from trail runners motorcycle riders you know overlanders like anybody that, that uses the forest so that's really 
this partner collective is the tool that we're going to use to really draw in those partners so we have you know amongst santa cruz bicycles we have sierra nevada <coughs> brewing we have patagonia uh, shimano um, fox uh, ktm motorcycles is, is going to be joining um, so really this is uh, again trying to get that unrestricted funds so we can match up those grants um, we also have a trail adoption program this is a pretty unique uh, in that it's uh, on national forest and it basically allows um, individuals families organ companies to have recognition and sponsor maintenance on trails uh, trails that wouldn't otherwise get get worked on and it also uh, is a good chance to get folks out there digging in the dirt together um, we, you know, we barbecue for everybody, show them a good time. We also get some really cool work done. It's a trail for Scotty, right? Yeah, there's a trail for Scotty. <laughs> right on top of Packer Saddle. Yeah. yeah. One beer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now that we're, you know, we're out of the pandemic, I guess that's the word. Um, so we're going to bring some events back when the pandemic hit we had three big events we had lost and found as a gravel a gravel race festival uh we had the downyville classic and we were doing an event called grand duro and quincy um, those three events to our region was a 10 million dollar impact so when those went away it, it didn't just affect our organization it affected our whole region so we're really excited to start bringing these events back not just for us but for our communities um, so Lost and Found in June, uh, Downeyville Classic. This will be the 25th uh, running. Not, the, not. It's been more than 25 years. It'll actually be four years since we've done the Classic when we bring it back. Uh, with Santa Cruz Bicycles as the title sponsor again, helping us get over the hump and make this thing happen. So, and there will be the CRUD World Championships. So now you all know. What day do you run that We are. So this is a tough one, right? So we're, we're like, we're going to go on our typical August date. And then uh, we're bringing a contractor on to help us with some of the logistics. Uh, Breakaway Promotions, they're out of uh, Oregon. They helped us with Lost and Found. Um, and they're like, oh, we have a big marathon that weekend. So then you start looking through the calendars, right? And then we picked a date in July. And then um, Crankworks Whistler changed their dates. <laughs> And so uh, we're going, we're going uh, July 13th through the 16th, the week before Whistler. So uh, hoping to get like a big West Coast swing so people can come up through Downeyville and then head up into your neck of the woods. And your title sponsor could do both. Yeah. And it is the, it's the Crud World Championships, but it's also the most important bike race in the world, which is, uh, it's the all mountain world championship. So it's uh, Saturday is a cross country race. It starts in one town, ends in another. Uh, pretty awesome to have like a point to point still in existence. I think it's probably the longest running point to point. And then, uh, and then the Downeyville downhill, which is the longest downhill race in the nation. And we used to have where people could just choose to race the downhill or the cross country. And then as bikes started to evolve and we wanted to push people a little bit more, we came up with the all mountain. And so basically you have to race the same bike both days. So when you show up Saturday at registration, part of the process is getting your bike, the parts checked off and it, get, it gets weighed in. And then before the race each day, you do the same process. So no changing of parts, you got to ride the same bike. And I really pushed kind of the industry to have a bike that went uphill, downhill well. And then also we get pretty unique racers to this thing you know it's not your typical we've had we've had downhillers come to win especially when mark weir was shit talking everybody we'd have people come from all over the world that were top downhill racers and they would not not be happy uh so this is really like you know like one of our winningest racers is carl decker with giant bicycles he's just like a machine of a person but does everything really well so it is a kind of a unique category um and then we have a river jump we have a wild island so we tried to make it really family friendly we're out on the confluence of the yuba river um so yeah excited to bring it back and then we do uh fundraising campaigns so prize drawings um we do one with santa cruz bicycles um, which we had earlier in the year uh, this brought in um, around seventy five thousand dollars which was super needed helped me chunk down that $676,000 uh, mark. And then 
Right now we're doing one with uh, KTM motorcycles. This is our first uh, motorized campaign. Um, also trying to bring in partners like Dunlop Tires, uh, No Toil, which is like air filters, um, Giant Loop, which makes like travel bags for these bikes. So that's really a big part of the success of these campaigns is like our membership is like 35,000, but you get like these brands that have millions uh, in their social feeds and they start to push it. And that's when like you really watch, you know, you're watching your little thermometer and you have like Santa Cruz Bicycles does a post. It's like, boom, that was like a $10,000 lift, you know? So it's pretty cool to watch how the partners engage. And that's really a big success, you know, to these campaigns. And they're not, they're not raffles, they're prize drawings, which we learned when we had the first one we did, we had 35 grand in a PayPal account and they locked it down because you can't do raffles. Mm -hmm. And so we quickly renamed it five bucks a foot and backtracked of like your donation by, you know, buys you a foot of trail. Uh, so did some pretty major quick figuring and unlocked that account. Is that, that's, a, I'd love to hear more about that because that's, you love to do this, but it's always the online raffle that shuts it down. Yeah. One of our other, uh, you know, friends in, in the biz in uh, Washington, their board just decided, like, hey, we'll just take the hit. We'll see, you know, what happens. So they, they do it, but you know, we haven't figured out how to do that yet. So I'd love to know more. It's still super vague. We run into this all the time, <clears throat> and like we were just talking about yesterday, we were like, everybody has been told different rules of what you yeah. can. It was, just, it's kind of like a gigantic don't ask, don't tell thing. Yeah. It's just trying not to. We've done a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like the thing that we found is it has to be sweepstakes. Yeah. And so when you yeah. see those commercials that say no purchase necessary, it has to be free to entry, free to enter. So you can actually send in a free letter, right? Like I write an entry. And so when you see like what $5 gives you 10 entries, you have to kind of balance that out. Um, and then different places have different rules. So if you're doing it in New York, you have to put up a bond. If you're doing it in Quebec, it's illegal and you shouldn't do it there. Um, and so, yeah, different places, different places in Europe have different rules, but it has to be a giveaway. And so you would call it like a sweepstakes or a giveaway and there's actually, you can't purchase something. Um, I can't like pay to enter this thing. It has to be a, a free donation. Yeah, we do the same thing. We just follow what the League of American Bicyclists does. We just borrowed the exact same language, no purchase necessary. In order to enter, you can send an email to this address by this date and you'll be entered. Totally. Yeah, where the, the letters get really small and the person's <laughs> voice speeds up. Yeah. You're like, whoa, okay. Sweepstakes. Greg, what do you think like the KTM versus Santa Cruz? Like what are you hoping for for that fundraiser? I mean, we were like, that's a good looking bike. Right, so. Um, but it's your first time. It's yeah, and we're pretty time. new. Like in the moto industry is like yeah. pretty leery because they've had like trails taken away for them for years, you know. So like we're and you have to, you have to pick it up in Quincy at our office. So because it's got to like you got to kick the registration in and the, you know, the warranty. So um, I think we're like at forty five thousand right now. We had, you know, we have grand. But like KTM hasn't posted yet, Dunlop hasn't, so the partners haven't kicked in yet. Yeah. It runs till like November 22nd. So mm -hmm. um, we'll see if nothing else, like if people are learning about, hey, we work on motorized trails. Yeah, so, totally. which could be good or bad, right? Like Sierra Club, like, oh man, we gotta take these guys down, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's basically, um, the steps we've been using, we're not, we're not done yet, but um, again, we'll we'll make sure like people can get this, and when it is published, it'll be you know available all over the world. Just the different steps that we've taken. So, thanks for hearing me out. So, Mary, do you have um, another segment coming up? Is anyone right now like with a few minutes we could probably squeeze in for questions for Greg? If anyone's got, you want to move to New Jersey? <laughs> I just have a question about your uh, your NEPA funding. You um, you mentioned the environmental planner and GIS people, but do you rely on 
federal personnel to do those surveys for uh, botany archaeology, or do you fundraise and hire someone? Yeah, it's kind of a, a combination. And I think, like, one thing that's important, like, the first step that I did is um, to get support for this. I didn't want to go district by district because we're we'd be like 16 districts and um, like it's been talked about they all behave differently and it could just be one individual personality that um, you know like we had to wait like 16 years in Downeyville for a guy to leave so um, my first step was to reach out to the regional office so I went right to Vallejo region 5 which is like the mothership of all California national forests um, and this is a great tool like e-bikes. I got them out on e-bikes and just chatted them up. Um, and I already had like a few relationships, but I got the Pacific S Southwest region to sign on. We got a five year master challenge cost share agreement that basically is a MOU says, this is what we're gonna do, roles and responsibilities. And then, then I went to the forest supervisors of the Plumas, Tahoe, Lassen and Humboldt Toyabe and instead of going district by district, I got the forest to sign on with a master challenge cost share and then just chain of command now, the, everybody kind of falls under those. So when we do um, like for the NEPA CEQA, it's a combination depending on the forest and the district, um, but like a, more of a kind of a hybrid, you know, like we typically always fund it. So whether it's grant or our own general funds, um, but we have, we have contractors that are approved you know that the force is comfortable with that 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 they drive the document um they're like they're going to be the ones that basically give it to the forest to sign off on and then we use a combination of contractors and forest service staff like if the wildlife biologist has time and they want to go out there like we'll fund them or sometimes they have like oh, i have some funding we already have this project going on like what we're trying to do is now that we've had all this area burned, a lot of surveys are happening because like migration routes have changed for the animals um, and then just watershed work. So trying to piggyback on those surveys that are already happening. So we're able to cut down our costs um, and, and not duplicate work. Um, so it's like combination of contractor, forest service staff. And then we don't write the documents ourselves. And one of the reasons is we don't want people like basically saying we controlled the whole project. You know, like we have an environmental planner that works with the contractor and the forest service that speaks the language that makes sure everything is in order and done. But um, again, we're just making like we just have we make recommendations of the forest. It's their decision memo that gets signed. So this like we're saying, hey, in concept, we'd like this trail to be open to all users. There might be areas where the forest says that's not, um, you know, that's not going to happen for these particular reasons. And maybe it gets you know, it's non-motorized in some segments. So, Thank you. yeah. Craig, uh, you're adding a lot of miles of trails. And I think, what was it, 10 million or something to move your budget for doing all of that stuff around your connected community? 40, 40 million. Okay, do you, do you look at your future budgets and say, okay, now 2025, needs to be from 2.1 to 2.5 because you now you're gonna have to maintain all those additional miles of trails. So I'm kind of curious about the ratio of you, you got 40 million of trails coming in and what does that do to your future budgets? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's honestly part of like just having really good best practices and how we build the trails. Um, you know, like Henry's our, he's our main trail builder. He's He's been on every single project, he knows you know, he knows the optimal location. So it's just like real thoughtful how the trails get built. Mainly it's like deadfall removal is where the cost comes in. And so having like these trails, it's one of the reasons we like motorized trails because there's California off-highway vehicle funding, which is a $30 million pot of money that comes in through gas tax and through registration. Um, so we're able to like typically, you know, we're bringing in like a million and a half dollars a year for maintenance. Um, so that's one of the mechanisms. And then adopt a trail is another one. Um, so while we build this out, we want to create, like we're estimating around 150 jobs. We don't want to go like to 300. And then when the trail's built, we don't have those jobs anymore. So we figure like at that level, we can maintain the trails once they're built. 
and then also just new business opportunities that are going to get created whether it's you know you start to bring tourism into these towns and like now you need you know like a coffee shop and maybe a brewery you know but those opportunities didn't exist until tourists were there you know in some of the motels like you wouldn't send your worst enemy to stay in <laughs> but they need they need people staying there so they can like buy a new mattress paint the place you know so um the jobs won't just be our hires are you seeing the conversation come from that side of it now from the city planning and activities yeah it's, it's all economic development is what they like to hear and having the youth element you know like our our youth crews they all um, we have a, a similar trail builder curriculum with the college, so they get enrolled in Feather River College, which is a junior college, so they're getting credits. Um, and then we work with like Center for uh, Work Development, so a lot of our hires come through and they're subsidized by the state. So there is some advantages being in a severely disadvantaged economy that um, trying to just take full advantage of all that. Part of that was like hiring an HR manager that knows how to navigate that stuff for us too. So, but. And then people that like maybe have questions or concerns, you know, you really break it down to like the job creation and like, hey, you want like your grocery store open, right? So you're going to have to have some kind of industry here. So it, it, it is all economy. Hey, Greg, in your questionnaires when you're talking about what people want from trails in the future, trail planning, do you, are you seeing a rise in like bike packers asking you about bike packing routes? Um, I think for sure. And a lot of that's because we have a gravel event, you know, and we're like our three forests, the Plumas, the Tahoe and the Lassen are the most heavily roaded because of the logging industry. So there's over 10,000 miles of dirt roads. So part of what we're doing is mapping those out. We're just calling them migration routes. So establishing them and, uh, and mapping them out. And then like for lost and found, we're trying to go like as carbon neutral as we can. So we're gonna start publishing these routes and encouraging people to bike pack to Portola for the event. And part of that's like riding the train, like Reno is one of the only stations you can bring your bike on and offload and um, so, you know, have a route from there. Um, but it is more and more like while we're out there, you're starting to see more more bike packers, which is, which is cool. And same with on the moto, like the adventure motorcycle riders, they're starting to get more involved. And part of that was just like mapping it people like to plan their vacations, look at a map with 10,000 miles on it, and they're not that comfortable. We're seeing that too. There's a group out of Oregon that's putting something together because you can't ride the, the timber track. I think so, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you can't ride the Pacific Coast Trail in right. our area, it's all wilderness. No, you can't ride it. Yeah. And then there's the Orogenesis, which is gonna be yeah. the longest trail in the world from yeah. Canada to Baja. And, Connected communities will plug into that. How do we route through our forest? And what we did was what kind of what Greg did. He said, well, you need to be routing this way so you can go to this store, or you need to be routing through this so you can go to those businesses. And they they initially just wanted the cool trail. And we're like, no, no, it's have you, got, these have you guys heard of the USGS trails application? Um, so part of the USGS on the national map, they have a new tool that's available for nonprofits and associations to use. And it's all about making connections between trail networks, communities, and different areas. So you could put in attractors, you could put in uh, areas that you want to avoid into this network, and it'll crank and, and come up with your best routes. You could set parameters like slope to avoid slope that you want to have. and. Uh, pretty damn interesting and, and for the size of what you guys are talking, it's perfect. It's called Trails. I'll send a link to uh, Katie. And to, to answer Dave's question about a ratio, there's a common ratio of 10 to 20% for maintenance and operations of the build cost. Okay. And that can include both paid and unpaid staff, which leads me to the question, Greg, how do you, have you used your volunt the volunteer time and that California volunteer hourly rate as part of some of your matching grant opportunities? Is that <coughs> that same thing exists in most states, most other places? For sure. Well, I mean, we track every single volunteer, their hours, and and leverage it. You know, match it up with grants. Could you explain Not, how that works? Yeah. So, like, when like a, I'll just use the OHV grant as an example. Like, you know, you ask for a million dollars. 
and it's a, like a 51% match and that match can come from volunteers. So there's an approved state rate on volunteers, their hours, which I think is like around 30 bucks an hour. Um, and then also equipment. So anytime we're using like our excavators or you're driving one of the crew trucks, it used to be you could like now chainsaws aren't included. They don't figure they're as expensive enough. We used to be able to do like hand tools for like 10 bucks. Chainsaw was like 50 a day. So right now it's like motorized wheelbarrows, excavators, kind of tools like in, that are over like five grand we can show as a match. Um, and then staff time. So if we're paying staff to work on a project, um, but it's very, you gotta really be tight on how you account for everything and have like the volunteer sign-ins, like they want like the handwritten sign-in sheet with a person's name and you know, so it's, it's very detail oriented. They don't want you mixing funds. If there's something we can do collectively is get our organizations away from that hand signing crap because that is so hard. Yeah, we we use uh, we just got approved to use it's called Forms on Fire. I think is what how appropriate for us up there. Um, <laughs> but it's an electronic sign in, um, and we still do the paper one because we just have both. But we we do want to move around away from the. Because people, you can't even read their writing, some of them, you know, and so yeah. having having it all loaded up. And part of like when they register for the event, it's, their name's already in there. They're just like checking the box that they're there. So it's not a big time consuming thing. Like when you have a hundred volunteers coming to work and you got like three tablets, it could be like an all day event of getting people to sign in. It's a huge challenge for us to just, to, we, we record the hours, right? And that's kind of easy. It's like, oh, squiggle one, got 1.5 hours, squiggle eight, got, you know, doesn't, you know, you got the squiggles and you count the hours, and that's what really matters to all those guys. But for us organizationally, we can't say, Greg, you've given us 200 hours this year, and Matt, you've given us, you know, another 150 hours, because it's so hard to get into that yeah. format from these paper forms that are required by all these other groups. So, yeah like i said that's a collective thing we could all do is like push back on that and say you guys need to upgrade your system because it's hurting you know our ability to, to do more yeah and you want more time and work money and you want to recognize those volunteers yeah. like those top yeah. volunteers like hey you put in 50 hours get up here you know and yeah. Uh, I I gotta get you guys off here i think we can like continue talking about stuff it's kind of a good segue into the um next session when we can